Welcome to Talking Buffalo, featuring conversations with guests from around the world of sports, media, pop culture, and all things Buffalo, with your host, Patrick Moran. All right, so I've watched the game film. I have poured over the PFF grades, and I got a bunch of takeaways, week seven takeaways, the Buffalo Bills with a, well, at least on paper anyway, a resounding victory on Sunday over the Tennessee Titans to move to five and two on the season. Plenty of it will be going over today on this episode of Talking Buffalo, your weekday daily driver for Buffalo Sports Talk and more. My name is Patrick Moran. Big, big thank you as always to everyone out there for watching and for listening, for following and subscribing. I know it's my spiel at the beginning of every episode, but I can't overstate it enough how much I deeply appreciate everybody who's been tuning into the show, whether you're listening to it on the audio side, whether you're watching it, On the video side, it it truly means a lot to me. So thank you very much. Uh, Like I said, today's going to be biggest Buffalo Bills week seven takeaways. This is probably my favorite show that I do each week. Um, We have a a post-game instant reaction type show. That's fun. And it's often more emotional, you know, really high or really low, depending on how the game goes minutes or maybe even a couple hours after the game, but you're still kind of got that adrenaline kick going. Uh, You can say things in the heat of the moment, good or bad at times. But what I like about this show is having an opportunity to sleep on the game and then get up early and start going through the film, watching some plays two, three, four times. If there's something that I really want to see or something that I feel like I might've missed and then I'll pop open like around mid-morning. They come out, uh, the PFF grades, which I often take with a grain of salt. But I do think in a lot of ways, they tell the story of a game as well. Sometimes they will confirm something that I already thought. Or sometimes they'll make me look twice as something that I thought was right, but maybe uh, I was wrong about. So these are a little bit more measured takeaways as opposed to doing a live post-game show when things feel a little bit more uh, emotional. So. That's what we're going to get into today. A real mixed bag of good and bad. Uh, before getting that, though, a couple quick things here uh, I wanted to get off at the very top. Didn't talk about it on the show yesterday because I had Joe from Queens on me and or with me, I should say, not on me, with me. And um, we got right into the game. But I did want to take a quick moment to shout out uh, a couple people from an event Saturday at Resurgence which I've said it many times on the show, I'll say it here again. That has become my favorite place to to go out and have a couple beers and, and just hang out probably anywhere at this point in Western New York. But big shout out. I want to start with Charlie Roberts. He's like the brains behind the entire operation. Um, a series of children's books co-authored with uh, former Buffalo Bills players. Stevie Johnson has been a part of this from day one as well. And it's just become really successful. Um, They've had a book with with Stevie. They've had a book featuring Fred Jackson. They've had a book featuring Ryan Fitzpatrick. And this latest one was with my guy, Eric Wood. So on Saturday, they had a book signing, which by the way, I need to point this out too. This is not a profitable business. This is a not profit. And a lot of money gets raised for charity. In this case, $1,300 $1,300 got raised for uh, the Evan Wood Foundation at O'Shea's Children's Hospital. But anyway, Stevie and Eric were there for a handful of hours on Saturday afternoon, signing copies of the book and signing whatever, you know, fans brought in to have signed, um, chatting with them, taking pictures. It, it was a really, really fun time. And I, I got to say this, Stevie Johnson and Eric Wood are two of the most down-to-earth former Buffalo Bills players that you'll ever meet. Um, Eric is very, he's kind, he's he's just, he's not, it's not even so much that he's outgoing. He's just so friendly and easy to talk to and approachable. And I've always respected that about him. I've become pretty good buds with Eric over the last handful of years. We talk about wing stuff 
all the time. In fact, we were supposed to go out for wings after the signing, but a couple of things came up. So that didn't work out. But anyway, Eric just could be a nicer dude. Stevie is borderline nuts. Like he'll seek people out in a crowd to go up and have conversations with. I just love that about both those guys, man. Again, like I said, they're just, they're so down to earth. They're so friendly, so chill and fans feel comfortable being around them. And I just, I love to see that. You know, I love the bills. I've always loved the bills. Most of you are watching or listening. You love the bills as well. Some of these guys you look at as larger than life characters especially kids and the kind of impression that somebody like, whether it's Eric or Stevie or any of these guys, former Bills players or current Bills players that they leave on a kid could really influence and shape what they think growing up. So to see the way these guys just interact with, with everybody, but especially the kids, man, it's just, it's really awesome to see a great event. Again, I love resurgence. Stevie Johnson, another shout out to him. I'm not sure he had anything directly to do with this, but there's a new bear, a new pills there called why so serious uh they were selling it they debuted it on saturday um they, like a dollar for every pint that was purchased on that day money went to charity i contributed about six seven bucks at least because i had six or seven of them uh really good but some friends came up there uh there were bills backers from scotland um from over in the uk germany uh del reed was up there for a while ryan talbot was up there for a while it was just uh that was a hell of a lot of fun. So I just want to, again, shout out Resurgence, my favorite place to, to hang out and, and drink at. I'm taping this a little bit earlier on Monday at following a Sunday game, a little bit earlier than I normally would. And the reason why I'm pointing that out is because Sean McDermott usually gives an injury update at around 4 p.m. or so. I believe he's, he meets with the media on Monday. Um, I'm recording this before that. And I'm recording this before that, by the way, because I'm going to the Justin Timberlake concert tonight at uh, Key Bank Center, which I'm not a big concert goer. I like concerts that are typically in smaller venues or outside where I just feel like I got a lot of room. And I'm typically the person who will go see like nostalgic acts. I like to watch artists that I grew up liking or maybe even somewhere in the last 10 to 15 years or so. But to go see somebody who's like, at the the height of their popularity, live is very rare for me. So I'm kind of looking forward to it. Um, this is only the second concert actually I've ever seen at the arena. And to my point, the first one I saw was about a year and a half ago or so. Brian Adams and Joan Jett, who were big many, many years. I mean, they're still big now, but they were at their peak many, many years ago. So I'm looking forward to uh to seeing that. I'll let you know you know, what I think of the concert, how that turns out and stuff like that. But um, in terms of missing Sean McDermott's update, I, I, I wish I wasn't, but I have to get this in the can a little bit earlier. i um, very interested in seeing what the deal is with Terrell Bernard and his ankle injury. Like, that's the big one. Hopefully, nothing major. I, I would feel like it's a little bit encouraging to see him uh, walk off the field, even though trainers were beside him, but to actually walk off, not get carted off. Hopefully that is uh, some good news. And then there's some other guys that got dinged up uh, as well on Sunday. Uh, I know Dwan Smoot did, Dawson Knox, uh, Dwayne Carter. Uh, they got dinged up. Curtis Samuel got hurt in the first quarter, shoulder, didn't return. So you might get some update on uh, these guys from Sean on Monday, but I'm recording this, unfortunately, a little bit uh, before that. And then one last thing too, stick around to the end. I'm going to give you some evidence here at the end of this podcast why you really, especially if you're a gambler, you need to start paying attention to my bowl predictions when I had my weekly Bills preview and bowl predictions episode. I crushed it two weeks ago. I went three for three, and I hit on two more bowl predictions uh, at the end of the episode on Friday. I'm going to play a little clip from that. Take my victory lap uh so to speak especially if you like betting on anytime touchdown scores and you want to get some pretty good betting odds on them the last two i've nailed i nailed mac hollins two weeks ago and i nailed another one for the bills uh in this game so stick around to the very very end for that before getting into uh like the actual specific takeaways from this game i do one special shout out josh allen by the way 100 starts now with the bills including 95 in a row. 
And to me, that is incredibly, incredibly impressive to, for Josh Allen to start 95 games in a row. That shows like unbelievable toughness for any quarterback to do that, let alone somebody who takes that physical pounding like Josh Allen does nearly week after week after week. He extends so many plays. He takes off running. And when you play that style of football, you're susceptible to getting hits. I mean, they run design draws for him or sweeps for him. The, the old tush push. So Josh Allen is, you know, he's enduring plenty of physicality every week. And to go out 95 consecutive games without missing a start, it's just unbelievable. Like that is a man's man right there, uh, Josh Allen. Getting into takeaways from this game. I'm going to pound a, a tweet that I put out on Sunday right after the game all week long here on this show because I really think it holds true to what, at least so far anyway, the 2024 20, Buffalo Bills are. I said the first half, and I don't have it in front of me, I'm only slightly paraphrasing, but I said the first half, is everything about the Buffalo Bills that is wrong. Everything that's wrong about the Buffalo Bills as a team we saw in the first half. The second half is everything that the Buffalo Bills are capable of being. Both sides of the football. They stunk, for the most part, on both sides of the football in the first half. And they were world beaters in the second half, that team that I saw in the second half, I don't know that there's a team in the league that's going to stay with the bills, regardless of who the opponent is. If they could play football like that easier said than done. I'm just saying, but if they play like they did in the second half, there's not a lot, if any teams that are going to beat Buffalo, but you know, it, it goes back to the first half again. It's frustrating to come out and play like that. The Bills are becoming very notorious. And let's forget about seasons past because every year is a new team, new players, uh, in this case, new coordinator. Technically, two new coordinators from the start of the season anyway. So we'll just treat this season as its own and not lump it in with all the others under Sean McDermott. So let's just talk about 2024 here. It's frustrating to come out and sleepwalk like the Bills have done so many times this season. The Bills have played seven games this season. And yes, I get it. They're five and two, and they're looking really, really good in the AFCs. And we'll talk about that. That's what matters at the end of the day, getting a win. I get it. They've won five out of their seven games. But they're making it very hard on themselves with the way they're coming out and starting games. Five times this season in seven games, the Bills have ranged from meddling to straight up playing like crap in the first half. They did it to open the season at home against Arizona. Fell down 17-3. Ultimately, they got away with it. They went to Baltimore, and they laid an egg in the first half, and they got pounded. They went to Houston the next week, dominated in the first half. I think they were down 17-3 at halftime. Came back, forged to come back in the second half, but too little, too late. They dug a big hole for themselves in the first half. Didn't think they were particularly good against the Jets last week, even though by halftime they had a, a lead and were not for a Hail Mary. Could have been a two-score game. But still, they just, not a good start for them. And then this, this game against Tennessee, I mean, just a brutal, brutal, brutal start. Both sides of the football. Uh, too conservative to start these games. Both sides of the football. Boringly predictable on offense to start these games. And you know what? Boringly predictable on defense to start these games too. Bobby Babbage is playing that base nickel early on and he ain't moving off it. They're not blitzing. They're not bringing pressure. They're not switching anything up. And I think it's allowing early success for offenses. Like I said, at the beginning, of games. So I don't know what the hell is going on with Sean McDermott and the Buffalo Bills when they come out of that locker room and go on to the field to start a game. Maybe they need 
a new team meal. Maybe they need a, a different sleep pattern. Maybe they need a, a different pregame speech. I don't know what the hell is going on, but this is a football team right now that is coming out and playing really shitty to uh to start games. It's as simple as that. Uh, but but hey, this is what I'm talking about. Second half, different story. That was the second half of that game was easily the best this offense has looked this entire season. And let's add this: couple injuries, but still. They did it against a very good defense. You know, Tennessee had one win on the season, and by the end of this game, you saw why. But they came in a very good defense. They came into this the number one defense in the NFL. By every metric, almost every metric, they were right near the top of the league. Now, granted, they played against some pretty shitty-ass quarterbacks before this, which maybe kind of gave them a little bit of a false front in how good this defense really is. But still, this is the NFL, and they have been defensively, at least anyway, I don't say dominant, but really, really, really good. So hats off to the Bills for exposing a good defense here in the second half of this game. Um, And beyond the score, beyond the stats, I saw a level of confidence in this Bills offense that, I did not have earlier in this week. Obviously, Amari Cooper coming to Buffalo is that big piece. We'll talk about him in a few here. But it felt, I don't know, just that second half looked and felt different. Once the machine got going, again, it's cold in the morning. The the machine don't want to start up. I don't like that whatsoever. But once things got rolling, that machine got going, man. Um... The way they use their receivers, the way they use their running backs differently too. Shakir, Kincaid, guys getting involved. Um, It was, as a Bills fan anyway, fun to watch. And just a level of confidence, I feel like, with Josh Allen having in his guys that I just, I haven't seen it recently, even though they've been winning. And I I didn't have that level of confidence in this Bills offense earlier in the week. That's for sure. Uh, One more point too. I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest here. Then we'll take a quick break. I think the Bills are damn lucky. All the stuff I just said about how they came out and played sloppy in the first half, conservative, boring, predictable, all I want to say borderline low energy. Um, Let's be real here. I think the Bills are lucky that they played the Tennessee Titans this week. Like when you look at the schedule and how things played out, this was a good week to play the Titans because you just played three consecutive really good teams. Well, two of them anyway, really good teams on the road. Uh, You only win one. You beat the Jets. A huge Monday night game. Huge, huge stakes. The Bills get a W in that game. And it would be easy to come home against an inferior opponent. Trap game. You know, a letdown. Whatever you want to call it. And in the first half, that's what happens. So they're fortunate that they played the Titans. Because straight up, the Titans were only up by three at the half. And it felt like it could have been 13 points. Hell, maybe even three scores. Like if you come out and you play like that and you're playing uh, the Kansas City Chiefs or you're playing lots of teams, I keep going on and on, Baltimore, whoever, Houston, you come out and you play like that in the first half, you're damn lucky to only be down three points. Those tight ends, guys I don't even, quite frankly, barely even heard of. They were just killing the Bills in the passing game. Uh, Three no-name tight ends, basically, uh, in that game for Tennessee, combined for 10 catches for 109 yards. So for the Bills to to play as bad as they did, as uninspired, I should say, as they did in the first half, but still only be down by three, to me, that was uh, was borderline amazing and, and set up a second half opportunity, of course, which they took major advantage of, set up by one play. And I'll tell you what, Biggest take it away the game coming up right here. I'm going to take a quick break, come back. That one play, I still can't get over it, and it completely turned the tide of this game. All 
right, I'm back, and I'm going over my biggest Buffalo Bills takeaways from Week 7. A big victory for the Buffalo Bills. 34 unanswered points. The Bills sit at 5-2 and two and in very, very firm control of the AFC East. All right, so this game turned in one play. The Bills down 10-7 to seven at the half. Lucky to be down just 10-7 to seven at the half with the way they played. Um, which, by the way, the Bills won the toss. Sean McDermott actually elected to receive and not defer. How much you want to bet that shit is not going to happen again for quite a while. But anyway, so the Bills are down three. They kick off. Tennessee moves the ball. I think they got one first down early in the drive. And then, so it's third and two, third and one. It's third and one. And they run Tony Pollard in a big run stop. We'll talk about that specifically here in a few as well, but it sets up a fourth, basically a fourth and two. And Tennessee head coach, Brian Callahan, who I thought up until this point, especially in the first half, I thought Callahan and his staff were borderline coaching circles around Bobby Babbage and Joe Brady and Sean McDermott. You know, one play in the first half specifically, I noticed the Bills at one point, Bobby Babbage had to, he goes to a three linebacker setup. So out goes Teron Johnson for a play, and in comes Balen Spector. Quite literally, that first play, Tennessee recognizes it, and they go right after Spector, a 19-yard successful pass. Just, they had all the, they just were all smart in the Bills. Like I said, utilizing the tight ends, the short pass the game, what Bobby Babbage was willing to give them. Tennessee, I thought in the first half, did a borderline brilliant job of, of taking what the Bills were giving them. And when I say talking about being lucky, uh, Mason Rudolph dropped a ball. It was a fumble technically, but it was all on Mason Rudolph. He basically dropped the football and Terrell Bernard happened to be there right place, right time and recovered the fumble. Bills didn't take advantage of it. And then they had one uh, breakdown Tennessee on defense that the Bills took advantage of, which led to their one scoring drive. But anyway, so like I said, Tennessee's up three. They're now, they lose yards on 31. It's fourth and two. They're on their own 44. And Callahan who, again, coached a really good, at least first half anyway, um, had a big brain fart. And this was a huge, huge blow to Tennessee. Now, I don't have any idea if the play call itself is on Callahan or if it was on their offensive coordinator, uh, Nick Holtz. I don't know that. But going for it, when you only got one win on the season and you're up three, hostile environment, you're on your own 44-yard line, I don't necessarily think that's a bad decision. You know, if it it's easy to be an armchair quarterback afterwards, but if I'm a t Titans fan and I got fourth and two on the 44 with the lead and my team stinks, you only got one win on the season, I got no problem. I, I would go for it as well. I'd want, I would not hate on Callahan for going for it. But the play call itself, I just, it just make it make sense. I don't understand it. They run out of a, a wildcat. Tony Pollard, no, it wasn't a wildcat. It was a wildcat on third down. But anyway, they run the ball straight up the middle to Tony Pollard, fourth and two. And they've had so much success in the short passing game. The Bills just could not cover that short to intermediate up until this point. Mason Rudolph, 14 of 18 for 112 yards um, when he was throwing between zero and 10 yards to this point of the game. It's just, it was just crazy to me to run the football. And sure enough, it got snuffed out. Dwayne Carter made a, a great play. Taylor Rapp made a great play. They filled the gap. They stopped Pollard. Turnover on downs. Bills score. They go up. They never look back. And by the end, it became a blowout. Again, it's easy to be an armchair quarterback. But my takeaway is, if you're Brian Callahan and you're going to go for it, why not try to move Mason Rudolph around and make, make a quick pass? Because if Tennessee converts that and they go on to score on that drive, that might deflate the Bills. Their home crowd, you know, you need to stop to start the third quarter and you don't get it. And now Tennessee goes up 17-7. I'm not going to say the game was over, but the Bills would have been in a whole world of trouble. So again, I don't even hate the, the decision of Callahan, but the play call, don't know if it's Callahan or Holtz, whoever, just an idiot play call. 
Bill snuff it out after snuffing it out on third down as well, score and take over the game. I also want to, this is going backtracking a little bit, but I'm going to tip the cap a little bit here to uh, the Bills kick returner, uh, Brandon Codrington. I thought this was a, a nice little wake-up call for the team. So they're down 10 uh Tennessee had just scored. And he gets the kick. He runs it out. It was a short kick, I think, actually. Um, he broke at least four tackles. Like, it looked like he was dead to rights. Ended up breaking a, a couple tackles. A really nice 27-yard return that got him out to the 39-yard line. It's only nine more yards than if the ball goes into the end zone and you start at the 30. So it's not like the nine yards was that important. It was just, uh, it was kind of like a little bit of a wake-up call to me, that play. Finally, somebody showing some heart and some toughness on the Bills, which, again, they looked really lethargic um, and flat. Flat's the right word, I guess, I'm looking for here to start this football game. I thought there was a nice little energy boost. And uh, it worked. Because on that drive, the Bills ended up having a a three-place, 61-yard touchdown drive to uh, to cut the score to 10-7. to now, granted, it was a complete busted coverage on one of those plays that allowed Keon Coleman to be out there by himself and, and go for 44 yards. But still, I, I thought Codrington's um, nice kick return, tough yards, breaking tackles, I kind of felt like that was a little bit of a wake-up call for uh, for the rest of the team. Um, as for Keon Coleman, I just mentioned him. He's had other big catches this season. He's had other big plays, big moments. But for me, this game on Sunday was his official coming out party. Again, 44 yards on that busted play was really nice. He also had a really nice uh, a back shoulder catch. Um, he had a catch on a short pass, made the dude miss, and took off to the races, a career best 57-yard gain. And I said it at the time, and I'll say it here again on this show right now. A couple of weeks ago, it was the Houston game where the Bills went for it on fourth and five. Allen, it's Coleman. Uh, the guy's slipping a little bit. Coleman makes him miss. He, he breaks the tackle, takes off down the left sideline, and he gets in for the touchdown. This game against Tennessee, same kind of deal. Short, he takes a short little pass, just makes the guy miss. The guy can't bring him down, and he's off to the races on a 57-yard gain. To me, that's starting to not become coincidence. To me, that's starting to become a trait that Keon Coleman possesses. Breaking tackles, yards after catch. He's doing that, and he's doing it regularly now. Four catches for a buck 25 on the day. First Bills rookie to have uh, that many yards since Sammy Watkins had 127, like literally a decade ago. Nearly had a really, really nice touchdown grab. Such a close call. Got to admit, I, I think ultimately the officials kind of got it right. So I'm not going to argue that, you know, he didn't get ripped off out of a touchdown, but just, it, it was a really nice play. It was a really good day for Keon Coleman. And I feel like week after week, you're starting to see him get more comfortable. And I feel like for me, it is time to move the goalpost on what my expectations for, 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 for Keon Coleman are. Cause I came into the season and I, I'll, I'll own it. I did not think he was going to do much as a rookie. I'm like, this guy's got a lot to learn. Um, it doesn't seem like he's separates well. Um, runs after yards after the catch. This is a trait that I just, I didn't see this coming. But I'm going to move the goalpost now because he can handle it. And he's getting more and more on his plate each week and he's responding. Right now through seven weeks, Kea Coleman has his pace. 39 catches for 792 yards and five touchdowns this season. So if I would have went back to week one or right before week one, and I said, if you could sign up right now for 39 catches, 792 yards and five touchdowns from Keon Coleman as a rookie, would you take that in September? I know I would. Would you? I'd be surprised if you didn't. Now, 39 catches, nothing special. 792 yard pace right now. That's insane. And the reason why he's got that pace is because he is third in the entire NFL right now in yards per catch. He's averaging 20.4 yards per catch so far this season. 
I think he's got 16 catches. Yeah, 20.4. Third best in the NFL. Only Jamison uh, Williams from Detroit and Alec Paris from the Indianapolis Colts are the only two in the NFL right now that are averaging more than him. So my expectations, especially with Amari Cooper here, which that benefited greatly, uh, my expectations of Keon Coleman are changing. And uh, he's he's got the ability. I don't want to compare him to what Stefan Diggs was. That's just borderline ridiculous. But I would think we could all agree that when you take Keon Coleman in the second round, you're like, well, I hope he could be as good or better than Gabe Davis was. I think he's well on his way to being as good or better than Gabe Davis was. Hell, some of you are going to make an argument right now that he's probably better than Gabe Davis. Gabe Davis was a, a guy who did nothing for three, four weeks, and then he would explode. I'd like to see Keon have a couple more games like this before I start putting him into a, a different tier. But what a promising breakout, uh, like I said, an arrival game for Keon Coleman. And as for Cooper, look, you cannot overstate at all uh, Amari Cooper's instant impact. First of all, the stats w- were fun. As a drop in the first half, which like, again, going back to the Bills, you know, looked like they were still sleepwalking like zombies in a lot of this first half as an ugly drop to nerves. Plus, he just has a history of making some drops. You got to live with that. Just like when Josh Allen makes a dumb play, throws a dumb interception, which he hasn't done this season, but uh, you just got to be willing to live with that. I think when it comes to Mari Cooper, Seeing a play like that from time to time is just going to be something that you have to live with. You hope it's not a a key third down drop in a fourth quarter of a very close game. But anyway, nothing for Amari in the first half, but that really changed in the second half. Four catches, 66 yards, the tutty, all in the second half. Um, You watch the film, and he did it in a variety of ways. Like, he beat zone, he beat man. Uh, There was one play where Tennessee was playing in a zone. Uh, he runs, he stops, he finds a soft spot in the zone, gets open, catches the ball, 27-yard catch and run. That was fun. And then, man, he won a slant, and he made a catch on a throw. Josh Allen threw it behind him, and Amari Cooper just made a great catch. Uh, Joe Biscaglia from The Athletic pointed this out. I, I thought this was great, too. The Bills averaged 10.4 yards per pass he play when Cooper was on the field Sunday. And this is a dude that barely knows the playbook. He don't even really know the playbook. He only knows a handful of routes. You saw some of the highlights on his touchdown, his slant, where you got Quadri Diggs a safety on him. I don't really get that call. But anyway, Keon Coleman basically tells him what the route is. You can see it on the the tape. It's wild. You know, we, we speculated throughout the week, and that's all it was until the game. It's just speculation, whether it's this show, whatever shows you, you tune into. You speculate. While the arrival of Mari Cooper should make the other guys better. On Sunday, we saw it with our own eyes. Again, Keon Coleman, over 100 yards. Um, Khalil Shakir, seven catches for 66 yards. Used the way I want to see him used. A chain mover. Throwing the ball in the middle of the field. Letting him get rack up some yards after catch, which he did a couple times. They also ran a, God forbid it worked. A bubble screen to Khalil Shakir. He's that guy. You throw the ball to him, first of all, he ain't dropping it. And secondly, good things are going to happen. You're going to get in, you know, they use a couple of quick passes to him that were basically runs, seven, eight-yard runs. I love the way Khalil Shakir was used. And Dalton Kincaid had a really good game too. Three catches for 52 yards. That's not exactly like the sexiest stat line, but two of those three catches were huge, huge plays for the Bills. So that whole trickle-down effect where Coleman, Shakir, and Kincaid, because those are the main four pass catchers, their roles look defined right now based on what we saw Sunday, and you love that. Um, One other thing on offense, uh, a takeaway that I have from this game, Spencer Brown, man, dude, dude was fantastic. He has struggled recently, and I almost feel like I'm being generous saying that he's only struggled. Honestly, I, I... He's kind of stunk the last couple of weeks. Tons of mistakes, mental mistakes, physical mistakes over the last couple of games. And this was following a start the first three weeks of the season where he was unbelievable and he got paid. But he's not played well recently. But man, oh man, that was not the case 
on Sunday at all. 55 snaps, completely clean stat line. No pressures allowed, no hits, no penalties. Um, had maybe the pancake block of the entire year on poor Amari Cooper. <laughs> or Hooker, I'm sorry, not Cooper. I'll get it right. I'll talk about Hooker, the safety for Tennessee. They ran that screen to uh, to Shakir in the fourth quarter. And man, dude, Spencer Brown got out, which is unfair. Big-ass Spencer Brown out of safety. Hooker, he flattened him. I propelled Khalil to get a 20-yard gain, set up a, a touchdown. He was great, man. 82.4 PFF overall grade. By far the best of anyone on the offensive line. 80.3 run block grade. Best of anyone on the line. 81.5 pass block grade. Best on the offensive line. Those numbers don't lie. He was that good. In fact, he low-key deserves a game ball in my book. So that's a big takeaway for me on the offensive side. Defensively, look, I'm not telling you something you don't know here, but Terrell Bernard's ankle is going to be hugely important. Finding out news this week, you hope it's day-to-day and that it's not nothing significant because this cat is just an unbelievable player when he's out there. 54 snaps he played, 16 he didn't. And you really could see the difference in those 16 snaps. It's, it, it's wild. Like I said, I talked about that game-changing stand that the Bills had on defense start the third quarter. That third and one wildcat, wildcat that Pollard tried to run, it was he and, and Dorian Williams, fellow linebacker, that stuffed it to set up the fourth and two. This dude shooting gaps. He's beating offensive linemen to the spot, blowing plays up near the line, behind the line, maybe for just one or two yard gain. He's just playing insane. Um, he also has just this incredible nose for the football. Mason Rudolph drops it. Guess who's there and gets the fumble. It's Terrell Bernard. He is such a really sound splash player. He makes impactful plays that change football games for the Buffalo Bills. This defense is literally night and day better when he's in the lineup versus Balen Spector. And that's not me trying to diss Balen Spector, just telling you the way it is. But look, let's be fair here. You have to worry about his body holding up. You do. Terrell Bernard's like 225 pounds, maybe soaking wet. And with the way he plays football, that reckless abandon, the way he throws his body around, the way he shoots those gaps, the physicality that a guy like him, his size plays with, that's going to lead to more injuries. It just, it is. Um, you know, the pack was a freak accident. The ankle, you can't really control much of that. He also left the game earlier with a, with a head injury. And, you know, he went into the medical tent, cleared protocol and came back into the game. But again, he went down twice. He's already missed four games this season with the pec injury. Um, he's just a critical part of this defense and you need him. So his health, is going to be critical because it's just not the same defense without him. Um, I wonder if Dorian Williams starts to get more work during practice, maybe at middle linebacker, maybe the bills get a little proactive as it gets closer to a potential Matt Milano return, hopefully in earlier December. Dorian Williams is really stepping up, man. He's improved week to week. He's playing some really good sound football, very physical guy. But make no mistake about it. If Matt Milano's healthy and active, Matt Milano's starting. And if they're, they're healthy at that position, you got Bernard, you got Milano. But right now, Williams basically is just Milano's backup. I'd like to see Williams get enough reps to be able to handle being a backup for either guy. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, quickly or two, I thought Tamar Hamlin actually had his best football game of the season. And credit where it's due, because I've been really, really hard on this guy. Maybe unfairly hard. I just don't think he's a very good starting safety. And I still don't. But this game, nothing spectacular, but solid. He had another interception his second of the year. Complete gift from Christian Bedford. Christian Bedford made the play. But if you watch the film, DeMar Hamlin was breaking towards the football. He was right there to make a tackle, even if the guy were to catch the football which my biggest beef with DeMar Hamlin for a lot of the season has been him being so far behind. He's so afraid of being beat that he's way off the football, just giving up way too much. Doesn't look like he plays with confidence. 
and uh, enough aggression. But I didn't really think that was the case on Sunday. I thought he was pretty sound. Thought he played a good game, good position, good job to put himself in position to make the interception. And, and you love to see it, man. So if I was Christian Benford, by the way, <laughs> one catch allowed, I think, for, for nine yards in this game, four targets. This guy's had one bad game. He, was, he did not play good against the Jets. Uh, Garrett Wilson had a lot of success against him. But you take that one game away, and I feel like as a whole, Christian Benford is like approaching that all pro level right now. Not pro bowl, all pro level corner. That's how good uh, Christian Bedford has been all this, all this season. But anyway, a really nice game. Bounce back for uh, for DeMar. Um, plus, look, I don't think the Bills are going to make a move there. I know a lot of people are talking about making a trade for a safety. I'm like, all right, well, find me the money because the Bills only have $2 million in cap space. Keep thinking about maybe they call him like a hide. Well, you know, now you're getting into the end of October. It still could happen, but no signs indicate that it will. They just... They value DeMar Hamlin more than they value Mike Edwards. That's obvious at this point. So if maybe your mindset as a fan should be, if you're stuck with him, you may as well start rooting for him to play well, because even if he doesn't, it doesn't seem like he's going anywhere. Uh, Tyler Bass, a nice drama-free day for him. Four extra points, two short field goals. I mean, real short, like 30 yards or under. Um, All down the middle, though. No drama. And it was really nice to hear the crowd very clearly getting behind him. I'm sure Tyler Bass could feel that. And last week on the show, I kind of was really critical of the Bills signing a kicker to the practice squad. I said, if you're going to bring in a kicker, you may as well sign him to the active roster and cut Tyler Bass, despite the dead cap um, hit that you would take. Because my, my mindset was, the problem with Tyler Bass is his confidence is just, it's shot, it's done. but. Um, maybe I was wrong. Maybe bringing in someone gave him a kick in the ass. And now he knows that he's got to step up. Maybe that pressure of knowing someone is literally looking over my shoulder at this point, maybe that will make him perform better. I'm hopeful. I'm happy he had a good day. But again, when you make two field goals from, you know, basically 30 yards or less, I'm not going to be too excited about it. Let's see how he does. If he gets some 40 to 49 yard opportunities, next week where he on the road too in a very hostile environment in Seattle where he's only two for five for the season and kicks from that distance. A couple other quickies real quick. Josh Allen, 16 to 25 for 264 yards and two touchdowns on passes between zero and 19 yards. That's been his bread and butter all season. All season. I know we want to see Josh throwing 50 yard passes left and right. Their success is coming in that short to intermediate game when he's getting rid of the football. Very promising numbers for him. I mentioned Dorian Williams. Impressed with him by defense. I thought Dewan Smoot stepped up as well. Um, I didn't think much of that signing. He didn't play early in the year because of an injury. Started a little bit slow, but you could definitely feel him uh, coming on. I thought he had a good game. Uh, I want to tip my cap to the Bills guards. David Edwards, uh, Cyrus Torrance, especially Edwards. They weren't great. But I thought they did an admirable job against Jeffrey Simmons and Devondre Sweat. Like, Jeffrey Simmons is one of those potential game wreckers. And he beat uh, Edwards once or twice. But overall, I thought those guys held their own and didn't let Simmons take the game over. Um, Harold Landry, the tackles, again, I already talked about Spencer Brown. Dan Dawkins got beat once, but overall, he was fine. Uh, Landry led the team in sacks coming in the game. Didn't even sniff the quarterback. I'm not even sure I heard the name Harold Landry. Uh, the entire day, a rough day for a talented duo of uh, Tennessee safeties. Like I said, Diggs got beat badly by Cooper on that touchdown. Hooker got blocked almost out of the stadium by Spencer Brown on that screen to Shakir. Those are two really good safeties. It was a rough day for them. A rough day for DeAndre Hopkins. I mean, this dude did nothing. Feels like it's the end of the road for uh, for DeAndre in uh in Tennessee. I wonder if Kansas City is going to end up with him. Ed Oliver returned, played 41 snaps, had a couple of nice moments in his return from the hamstring. Again, that's not an easy uh, injury to come back from. I got no issues with the way Ed played. Uh, it was nice to, it was nice to see the refs not be a huge factor in this game, especially after last week 
in that Jets game. That was just ridiculous. The, the, the refs took over that game. They made it about themselves. Let a lot of shit go, actually, this game. A bullshit pass inter interference penalty against Russell Douglas earlier in the game. But that aside, not really anything controversial that I think they got wrong. Oh, it's by the way, on that pass interference, at least on the regular broadcast, CBS never showed a replay. I thought that was a pretty shitty uh, broadcast overall by CBS. Um, yeah, five penalties for 40 yards for the Bills. Not bad. Uh, last takeaway, not a big deal, at least in this game. Hopefully it won't be going forward, but not a really good day for Bills punter Sam Martin. Five punts, uh, just a 39.4 average, 33.8 net. And we shanked one punt for like 29 yards. So not a good day for him. I ought to wrap up here because I want to get out um, to conclude. Look, the AFC East is the Buffalo Bills to lose now. And I mean, it's not even debatable at this point. The Bills would almost have to completely fall on their face to not win this division. Pittsburgh beating the Jets, huge for the Buffalo Bills on Sunday night. They're two and four. They got, what, a three, three and a half game lead now on the Jets. Um, they beat in Miami. Both those teams, they've already won on the road. So not only do the Buffalo Bills sitting at five and two have a big lead in a very under uh, underachieving division as a whole this season, but you get close to the end of the season, it comes down to it. The Bills play the, the New England Patriots, who right now they're one and six. Bills play them like two times in their last three games. So it's looking really, really good right now for the Buffalo Bills to win this division yet again, return to the playoffs yet again, and get a minimum of one home game uh, yet again. But right now, I'm not allowing myself to think any further than that. Like I said it last week, this game does not change my mind whatsoever. I'm not thinking about the conference. I'm not thinking about the best record or even the two seed right now in the conference. Right now, I'm just thinking about win your division, that gets you into the playoffs, and make sure you're playing your best football at the end of the season. That's all I'm locked in right now. And they got lots of stuff that they need to get right, but lots of time to do it. But at the end of the day, folks, the Bills win, Miami loses, New England, who cares, they lose, and the New York Jets lose. All three teams in the AFC beyond the Bills lost on Sunday. So it's a big, big, big Sunday uh, for the Bills. Tomorrow's show, Matt Warren is going to join me. We'll put a bow on this game. Uh, a few more talking points. We'll start to turn our attention to the Seattle Seahawks, who the Bills play next on the road. And they smacked Atlanta uh, on Sunday. They're 4-3 on the season, a high-powered offense. Uh, DK Metcalf has a knee injury, but they're saying it's positive. He got carted off, but they're saying it's not a major injury, so we'll see how that plays out this week. Definitely going to be a test for, for Bobby Babbage. Real quick, like I said at the beginning here, victory lap time on Fridays or the day before a Bills game, or Friday before the Bills game, I should say. Do a preview. Keys to winning, a little bit of information about both teams, and then I like to do, for fun, bowl predictions. So two weeks ago, I nailed all three when they beat the Jets. I had it going over barely. In fact, I was only off on the score prediction literally by one point. I had Matt Collins scoring a touchdown, and I had uh, Teron Johnson not just getting an interception, but also getting a late fourth-quarter interception to help seal that deal. This game against Tennessee, one perfect, all right? One perfect. I did call myself out here. I don't want to act like I was perfect, but I said that Josh Allen was going to throw his first interception of the season, and I was not right about that. But anytime touchdown and a player that was going to step up, I nailed them both. Let me replay here who I said was going to be the Bills anytime scoring or touchdown score in this game. Aaron a setback. He's going to play. He's going to start. Ray Davis, if he's out there, he looked really impressive last week. He's going to get some carries. So I don't know how many opportunities Ty Johnson's going to get, but he's going to take advantage of one of those reps and he's going to find, he's going to find the end zone. I feel it through the air too. So we'll even call that a bonus one. Ty Johnson scores a touchdown through the air. All right, so that's me calling a Ty Johnson touchdown. Ty Johnson did score, and he scored through the air. And again, it's not like I'm saying Josh Allen's going to score a touchdown or, uh, you know, Dalton Kincaid. Two weeks ago, I said Mac Hollins. This week, I said Ty Johnson. 
And then the other thing I got right was I said it was about time for somebody who's a very talented player on defense to finally step up and have the type of game that we know they're capable of. Here's that. I have a big game. Week one in Buffalo, Sunday, 1 p.m., Greg Rizzo, AFC Defensive Player of the Week. I thought he was fine in Miami and fine against Jacksonville. But these last couple weeks, he's been, I don't want to say he's been shitty, but he's been very ordinary. Just another guy out there. And Greg Rizzo is more than that. Greg Rizzo needs to be more than that, especially when the Bills start playing some of these really good teams down the stretch of getting into the playoffs. Again, star players have to play like stars when they matter the most. Now, this is not a game that matters the most. This is just one of those 1-17 of games, but we'll call it a get-right game for Groot. So Groot is going to have a big game. Those are my uh, bold predictions there. All right, so there you go. Groot was going to have a get-right game, and boy, did he ever, because he had six quarterback hits, which, by the way, six quarterback hits is the most that any player has had on a quarterback in this league in two years. So to say he had a, a get-right game, actually is a little bit of, a, of an understatement, even if he only technically had one half of a sack. But anyway, that's going to do it. Thank you very much for watching, for listening. If you have not subscribed, please do so. Uh, if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button on the video. But even if you are subscribed already on YouTube, make sure you go to Spotify or Apple and you hit uh, follow on there. It really helps us grow on the audio side as well. Matt Ward from SB Nation joining me tomorrow.